Well, it's certainly a joy to be back. And um, it's strange with, e with each of these figures that, that I try to write about. In many ways, it's when I begin to write about them, I realize I need, in some sense, to write an introduction in order to introduce the figure, and then the introduction itself becomes a paper. And so the figure that I want to address ends up becoming sort of pushed or deferred um, until later, and uh, such that this probably is more accurately sort of entitled a prolegomena to a reading of the, uh, the confidence man. But it's at the same time, I mean, it's, it's a reading of, of um, Melville's understanding or conception of truth, which I think is quite, quite singular. Um, and, and what intrigued me is precisely how to situate the enigma of the confidence, confidence man in terms of um, a conception of truth that, 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 uh, that makes the confidence man be into a strange figure that seems to hover at times between philosophy and sophistry. And so that's sort of the, um, I don't necessarily talk about sophistry per se, but it's certainly in the background of what I want to do. So I'd like to um, begin with three epigrams. I seem to add one each year, um, which would mean, I guess, the first year I didn't have one. But, um, but uh, next year, you can expect four. And the following, then soon, I'll just have a paper of epigrams. But. So the first is from uh, Pierre the Ambiguities. Appalling is the soul of man. Better might one be pushed off into the material spaces beyond the uttermost orbit of our sun than once feel himself fairly afloat in himself. The second is from The Confidence Man. You, conclu you can conclude nothing absolute from the human form, Barber. And the third is also from The Confidence Man. Like one beginning to rouse himself from a dose of chloroform, treacherously given, he half divines too that he, the philosopher, had unwittingly been betrayed into being an unphilosophical dupe. To what vicissitudes of light and shade is man subject? He ponders the mystery of the human subjectivity in general. Melville, Melville's uh, modernity is deeply, annihilatingly dark, emanating from a hidden sun, indicative of what Nathaniel Hawthorne referred to as Herman's morbid state of mind. Although Hawthorne himself attributes this morbidity to his literary failure, to the many years of toil toilsome pen labor pursued without much success latterly, as Hawthorne put it, it is more illuminating to interpret his morbidity as a symptom of his increasing awareness of being stricken with a strange, mal a strange malady, not unlike that which strikes the protagonist of Artaud's 18 seconds of screenplay. It is as if he, Melville, has become incapable of reaching his thoughts. He has retained all his lucidity, but no matter what thought occurs to him, he can no longer give it external form, that is, translated into appropriate gestures and words. And Melville's writing, with increasing intensity in his later years, attests to his struggle to write that which is inaccessible in his thought, to force into language a truth that cannot be translated into appropriate words and gestures and can only be improperly expressed. As Melville himself describes, Pierre, from the, the central character of Pierre, the ambiguities, as Melville himself describes Pierre's long and tortured eight and a half hour long sessions of writing whose crippling silence is only interrupted by the scratch of pen on paper, like, quote, the busy claw of some midnight mole in the ground, and by the occasional cough and sometimes the scrape of his crook-handled cane. He writes, in the heart of such silence, surely something is at work. Is it creation or destruction? Builds Pierre the noble world of a new book? Or does the pale haggardness unbuild the lungs and the life in him? Unutterable that man should be thus. And I have to say that uh, at three in the morning last night I felt I was, I was saying this to myself, unutterable man should be thus. Um, 
And this book, this, this, this composition that the Pierre is trying to write decomposes him as he writes it, right? Sucking him of, of vitality. And each book then becomes an indeterminate document of the failed attempt to capture, this is a quote from Pierre, the primitive elementizing. So the primitive, it's a strange uh, neologism, the primitive elementalizing, and elementalizing, yes, okay, of the strange stuff which in the act of attempting that book <coughs> is upheaved and upgushed in his soul. Each book then is in fact two. As the narrator of Pierre attests, there is the book that requires ink and the book whose unfathomable cravings drink the writer's blood and circumstances have so decreed that one cannot be composed on paper, but only as the other is writ down in the writer's soul. Fastened on by two leeches, the writer who seeks to write the life of the mind finds himself fatally divided, devoured from both ends by a thought that touches upon a truth at the cost of its own destruction and a language that cannot but betray the thought so destroyed. As Melville himself writes of Shakespeare, such destructive, soul dismantling truths can only be uttered out of the mouths of dark characters who craftily say or sometimes insinuate the things which we feel to be so terrifically true that it were all but madness for any good man in his proper character to utter or even hint of them. And Melville's fictional universe is populated with figures who follow the trail of truth too far, entirely losing, as he puts it, the directing compass of the mind. If Melville's pessimism at times seems absolute, it is because the encounter with truth as such is fatal, likening these unfortunates to undiscoverable Arctic explorers forever lost amid Admits, admits those treacherous regions. For arrived at the pole, to whose barrenness only it points, there the needle indifferently respects all points of the horizon alike. In Melville, then, truth does not serve to anchor or ground the subject, as in Descartes, or serve to orient it, as in Kant. It disorients. The in itself marking the collapse of signification, the abolition of geographical coordinates, rather than, promise, rather than offering the promise of fulfilled meaning, promises absolute disorientation. And truth itself, marking its advent, and truth itself, marking the advent, right, this, this sort of, this, this region of disorientation, marks it only through the announcement of its ultimate vacuity. So truth announces itself as the vacuous. And it's the revelation then precisely of an essential vacancy. What Ahab from Moby Dick already intimates, Pierre verifies. Those who have waked the infinite wakefulness in themselves, the desire to strike, strike through the mask, discover only the essential nullity of all things, the fact that there is not beyond. And those like Pierre who turn their searches within find only a desiccated tomb. So here's a, a quote from Pierre. The old mummy lies buried in cloth on cloth. It takes time to unwrap this Egyptian king. Yet now forsooth, because Pierre began to see through the first superficiality of the world, he fondly weans he has come to the unlayered substance. But far as any geologist has yet gone down into the world, it is found to consist of nothing but surface stratified on surface. To its axis, the world being nothing but superinduced superficies. By vast pains we mine into the pyramid. By horrible gropings we come to the central room. With joy we espy the sarcophagus, but we lift the lid and no body is there appallingly vacant as vast as the soul of man. <clears throat> 
This is the truth. We could say the truth of truth that crushes Pierre and that renders him incapable of, sa- of, of sustaining his commitment to the truth which he had consigned his life, leading to his radical skepticism with respect to the truth. Right? He, he claims it's everlasting elusiveness and ultimately leads to not only his own destruction, but that of the new family he tried to found. Pierre thus proves unequal to the truth of modernity. Right? In other words, the, the truth of its own profound, of the profound nullity of its, of its foundation. So that Melville's work then, I think, it poses this, this essential problem, given this sort of, we could say, his radical nihilism, is that, in other words, if in fact, right, the truth of the world is such that there's not, not beyond, the truth of the self is such that it is vacant, how can one live with such a truth, and can a society be founded upon it? And the paradox of this, I think, that, 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 that Melville sees, and this is why I think that Melville remains very interesting, is he sees deeply that this is a paradoxical insight. In other words, that those who have this truth, like Pierre, in some sense have to portray it. So one has to portray this truth in order to live or betray it or betray one's very life in order to remain convicted to this truth, which is namely so suicide. So one either has to betray the truth in order to live with it, right? So turn from this, the tr- turn from this truth, or betray one's, one's life in order to remain convicted, I mean, to the truth, namely commit suicide. So that the truth of modernity for Melville is essentially destructive and can only be attested to through the destruction of the soul of the one who apprehends it. And it's this fatal dialectic that I think Melville is, unpacks or deals with in Pierre the Ambiguities. And it's also this fatal dialectic that, that, I th- that I'm, I'm, I'm hypothesizing anyways, the confidence man will be a certain kind of solution to, but a, but an uneasy one. So the problem then that Melville, that Mel, I mean, that the problem that, 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 that the suicide of Pierre and those around him marks then his own inability, let's say, to maintain his two books, to maintain these two books that that divide him. This and the essential ambiguity we could say in this sort of, of, of Pierre is that Pierre, let's say, encounters a truth that requires a split in the object in order for it to be apprehended. So in other words, it, it needs, the, and this is the role of the nothing, but, the, the, but this very object, namely the not beyond, can only be apprehended through the production of a split or a division within the soul of the one who apprehends it. So that, the, in other words, one can only attest or, or, or think the truth that one is apprehending by subjecting one's own soul to a kind of ceaseless division. And the question is, is can one sustain right, these, two, these two gaps, the collapse of which marks the character's destruction? And the confidence man then, just to sort of foreshadow where I'll be going, will be the figure then that neutralizes this destructive circuit separating himself from the, the need to believe in truth. This is, this is the sort of hypothesis that I have. So unlike 
the figure of knowledge that, that I'll turn to briefly that works through irony, the confidence man performance of his own non-belief will rely on humor. So I think there will be an interesting sort of parallel that, 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 that the, Melville's last novel, The Confidence Man, which he himself had, describes as a comedy, will be a humorous attempt to resolve what he sees as this tragic structure of self-destructive um, subjectivity um, in modernity. And so it's helpful then for me to pose this, this, this problem, to take a detour, however brief, through Socratic irony. And I think um, this will hopefully sort of converge nicely with some comments that, that Sammy had to say earlier. So through irony, as we know, Socrates assumes the position of the one who knows through, through knowing that he does not know. Socrates' relation to the truth, namely not knowing, is maintained through his knowing that he does not know. The not, which establishes the difference between the known and the not known, serves to maintain the dominance of the form of knowledge over the negativity of the true. This is a, at least the claim that I'm making. So Socratic Elenchus makes use of negativity to unseat particular claims to knowledge, right, or particular opinions, doxa, exposing their lack of foundation by showing that assertion bears immediate relation to that which it is not. So showing that what appears to be consistent to be, in fact, inconsistent. So the negative, the not of truth, serves ultimately to reinforce the very form of knowledge, always to reinforce the form of knowledge, and therefore always plays a subordinate role. The negative then, the knot of truth, is subordinated to the known, so not knowing to namely knowing that one doesn't know. So as such, irony frees Socrates for any particular dogma, a particular knowledge, enabling him to inquire into knowledge as such, the former ground of knowledge, and the, gr the ground which he himself ironically always already occupies. He can thus show prove that something is false because he knows the ground of falsity, and it's only by occupying this ground that he can then deploy the negative, right, to expose the inconsistency of a, of a given appearance or truth. I mean, uh, of opinions. So the difference between not knowing and knowing that one doesn't know ultimately always serves to preserve the integrity of the logos as the form that makes possible the determination of the negative. The negative sign of truth, not knowing, serves to preserve knowledge as a whole, knowing that one doesn't know. Inconsistency is never radical then and merely serves to enforce the Socratic demon of consistency. Truth remains subordinate to, know, to the known. To know thyself is in its Socratic or Platonic conception to square then who one is, a seeker of truth, with what one is, one who knows right, that they are such a seeker. Put differently, the negativity of truth does not unseat the belief in knowledge, a belief that is ultimately sustained by the good. That is, it is good that we know, right? The belief that knowledge is, is good. <clears throat> so, in other words, what is known is true. Now, I think what Melville, what makes Melville interesting and why, I mean, I think why I wanted to present a paper on Melville's conception of truth is that he unseats this Platonic um, operation. So Mel from Melville's perspective, this Socratic strategy serves to protect or insulate the soul of the knower from the destructive effect of truth's negativity, released 
In other words, it becomes ultimately destructive when it's released from its subordinate position. So that we could say that in Melville, what we see is that in fact, the negative doesn't serve to reinforce the known, but serves ultimately to destroy the very form of knowledge. So that tr a truth can only be attested to through the destruction of the form of knowledge that, um, yeah, it can only be attested through, through, that, through that destruction of the form of knowledge. So this then shows then for Melville, or in Melville, I think, one has to make a distinction or distinguish between truth and knowledge. A distinction which is a truth which, which is constantly effaced at the inception of philosophy, namely that of, with Socratic irony, right? Which makes the truth what is known. In Melville, truth cannot be known since it, only, since it appears only in the destruction of the belief in the known, right? So that at the end then, right, and this is, I'll be moving, what the, 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 the figure, ultimately the figure of knowledge, uh, the figure of, of, of the modern knower for Melville won't be the philosopher but the misanthrope. And it's because the misanthrope is the figure that in fact occupies a position of absolute distrust, right, absolute non-belief, which will also be a paradoxical figure, and I'll get to that in a second. So that Melville is interested in this moment when in fact one's belief in the known, in the form of knowledge itself, is destroyed. Thus Melville inverts the classical relation between the true and the known, which subordinates right, truth to the known, as I was saying, sorry to repeat myself. Um, so that ironically within a modern context, the most terrific of truths, right, the truths that don't produce wonder but terror, are precisely those that cannot be believed, right? So that, in other words, the, the problem of modernity is that we can know things, but we don't believe in the things that we know. And that in Melville, what he's interested in is, is this pre process, this procedure of what happens when we suddenly are affected by a truth, such that we actually then come to believe in it, so to speak, right? So that it's it's... It's precisely then it, it begins to undo this fact this, that, that, that what undoes then the character is strangely enough coming to believe in a truth that's so terrible that it, it, it destroys belief. Right. And so the soul then becomes, <clears throat> Melville, the site that has to sustain this destructive circuit that strips the subject of belief. Right. And mo many of his characters don't, can't sustain that, 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 that destructive circuit. And Melville, let's say, Melville, however, is not naive, right? He, he, he's wholly aware of the dangers of this operation. And it is this danger that he treats in a short story, The Lightning Rod Man. The Lightning Rod Man is the modern embodiment, we could say, of Socratic sobriety. He's an earnest man of science, a dealer of lightning rods, who travels in storm time and drives a brave trade with the fears of man, as, as, as he writes. So the lightning rod man is a, is a cautionary tale. And so the scientist, like the lawyer in Bartleby, is portrayed as an eminently careful man who counsels the import of privileging knowledge over the truth. So the lightning rod is an instrument that allows one to mediate the unsettling effects of the true by grounding their shocks. Right. This requires not only knowledge of the laws of conductivity, but adequate preparation to protect the edifice of knowledge from truth's zigzag irradiations. Right. So the lightning rod man is ultimately wary of the truth out of respect and keen awareness of its power to strike dead those who encounter it, right? Think of being a heap of charred offal like a haltered horse burnt in his stall and all in one flash. The edifice of law and the armature of logic are there to protect the mind from truth's contingent strike. 
And for Melville, the figure of knowledge within modernity is ultimately then conservative, driven by a sense of piety, right? So it's a knowledge that has to protect itself from the truth that could potentially irradiate it. The artist or the writer, right? Or at least we could say the exceptional artist or writer, on the contrary, tests the very limits then of the sayable, placing himself or herself, but in Melville it's, 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 it's for the most part bachelors, um, strangely enough, but they're bachelors that are unmanned by the truths that they experience. So there's a strange um, androgyny oftentimes um, to, to his sort of gentleman. Um, so the, the, uh, the artist or writer placing himself at the very juncture where the dead letter the character touches a vital truth that electrifies it. So he's always placing them. And art then, contra the conservative tendencies of science, right? And namely, those who seek to harness its practical tendencies, marks a radical break between the true and the known by attesting to the destruction of the soul of those who apprehend it. And it is Pierre the artist then who commits himself to truth regardless of its effects. And so this is Pierre. Henceforth I will know nothing but truth, glad truth or sad truth. I will know what is and do what my deepest angel dictates. And this commitment entails the complete demolition of the system of beliefs that sustained Pierre's known world. Yet truth's destructive force pertains less, we could say, to the thing in itself. Namely, what Pierre finds out, which is the fact that he has a sister. Right? So this is just the sort of, in some sense, the knowledge that he finds out. He finds out that he has a sister. But this knowledge then will set in motion a sequence that will dismantle then all of the values that sustain his belief in the world, namely the belief both in, in the patriarchal figure of his father as being a noble person, and at the same time, his belief in his mother's love, right? And what he then comes to realize is in fact that both these values are utterly contingent, right? Contingent now, that a contingency revealed by this encounter with the true. But the, the true then is not an in itself What's interesting about Melville, he thinks that it, can, it only becomes true once one is affected by it. So it, in other words, it's, only an, it's an external encounter that has to be internally attested to. And it's that internal attestation that serves to divide the subject. And, and, and Melville is actually quite precise in this. So he, he defines then two moments um, of this, what I'm claiming this sort of sequence of the truth. One is pre what he calls the presentiment and the other is verification. And um, he, this is a sort of, um, there's a sub, that one of the, um, not chapters, but uh, books in Melville is titled Presentiment and Verification. And what's interesting then, and again, let me just, is that what this encounter then, right, with an outside that can only be attested to through an internal division Opens, Mel, opens Pierre onto what he calls the indefinite region of the self, right? And so let me just, just quote this for a moment. He says, he seemed to feel that in his deepest soul <coughs> lurked an indefinite potential, but potential faith which could rule in the, in the interregnum of all hereditary beliefs and circumstantial persuasions. Not wholly, he felt, was his soul in anarchy. The indefinite regent had assumed the scepter as its right, and Pierre was not entirely given up to grief's utter pillage and sack. So this moment, in other words, opens up a strange indeterminate space, right, which the act of writing itself, namely, will have to keep open. These, so the, this sort of doubling of the self and the doubling that takes place in the act of writing, these two books. And it's this sort of Pierre's inability, I think, to, to sustain this difficult space of this, 
this, this, of this moment of indefinite regency, right? Which then, which, which leads to the collapse um, of the, uh, the collapse of his, well, ultimately of, of his life. Where was I? Okay. How am I doing on time? I want to make sure. Am I okay? Okay. So let me just do this is a little bit, um, um, so this is a little bit more of a close reading, I think, of this, of this section of the presentiment and the, um, and, the, uh, and the verification. So the presentiment, what, what Melville calls presentiment, is a feeling that seizes the soul, appealing to one's own private and individual affections, which awakens a sense of wonder mixed with horror that Melville describes as an imperfect inkling that not always in our actions are we our own factors. Okay. So this supernatural, right, or ultramundane feeling is awoken in Pierre by the indeterminacy of two signs, right? A chance encounter with a face without a name, right? A face that later on we will discover is the face of his sister, but at this point it's merely a face without a name. Um, Thus, we could say a sign then without, without a clear signification, without clear meaning. And this face accosts him, eliciting a wild, bewildering, and incomprehensible curiosity in him to know something definite of that face. Right? And so this is the first sign. The second sign is then an unearthly, at the same time he hears an unearthly girlish shriek without a body. Right? which then happens to be this same, woman, this same face, right, fainting. And he says the shriek seemed to split its way clean through his heart and leave a yawning gap there. So it is not, it is not the thing, so to speak, right, namely the lineaments of the face, its brute physiognomy that, that stirs Pierre's soul. And Melville goes to lengths to describe that the inscrutability of this encounter, right, the nameless fascination of the face upon him, as he writes, as strange as it might, may seem, did not so much appear to be embodied in the mournful person of the olive girl as by some radiations with, from her embodied in the vague conceits which agitated his own soul. There lurked the subtler secret that Pierre had striven, to, had striven to tear away. From without, no wonderful effect is wrought. So, from without, no wonderful effect is wrought within ourselves unless some interior responding wonder meets it. Right? So, it's this interesting this displacement of an exteriority that then awakens this, 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 this movement within the interiority. And this initially is, is the pre presented as the presentiment, namely it is, is an affection, right? feeling. So in the enigma of the face, Pierre encounters an outside more internal than any inside and whose pursuit, right, because it's awakened this curiosity, drives him into the infernal catacombs of thought. A true then... Um, this we could say we could say this truth remains radically external unless it can seize or accost the soul, implicating it in the advent of a process of truth. Right? So truth then only is attested to after a fact, right at the end of a process. And so one feels that one is at stake in being gripped, and it is this presentiment of feeling that enables one we could say to sustain its initial inscrutability. Right? So no cause have we to fancy, this is a quote, no cause have we to fancy that a horse, a dog, a fowl ever stand transfixed beyond yon sky low. Uh, sometimes novel is hard to read. Um, no cause have we to fancy that a horse, a dog, a fowl ever stand transfixed beneath yon sky load of majesty but our soul's arches underfit into it, and so prevent the upper arch from falling on us with unsustainable inscrutableness. 
So it is the soul's arches that support the vaulted sky, but the soul, right, is not one with that sky. And for Melville, the revelation of this gap, namely that our affections are not one with the world, is what ultimately brings the sky crashing down on our heads, right? So this would be the shift from wonder of, of, of this vaulted sky to the terror of it crashing down upon us. And so this feeling then is, even in its inception, as he puts it, seemed to have in it a germ of, some, of, a, of somewhat, which, if not quickly extirpated, might insidiously poison and embitter his whole life. So, it is not then the thing in itself, I'm suggesting, that devastates, right? but precisely the conjunction, the encounter between the thing in itself and the process of affection that such a thing awakens. For the occurrence, um, yeah, for, for the truth to have an effect, it then has to be then intimated by this subject. Okay, sorry about this. Um. But this effect, right, the moment of truth really will only be confirmed, right? A, marking then the gap between the known and the truth, this sort of distinction that I had already introduced, through the process of veri verification, right? So that initially we had, right, the presentiment, which is the face and the, and the shriek that stirs Pierre in the heart of his being, let's say, but then he receives a letter, right? What Melville describes, so small a note. And it's this letter then that, that begins to ignite an inferential series that will ultimately lead to, Melville, uh, to uh, Pierre's complete destruction of his past life, right? His decision, right, strangely, to marry his own sister in order to preserve her honor. So he can only, you know, this is the strange position that, that Pierre finds him. He can, only, he can only ultimately preserve the honor of the woman he loves, right, this woman Lucy, who he's planning to marry, by not marrying her, but by marrying his sister, but, but not actually marrying her, but only appearing to marry her, right, in order then to... Um, save her from the contingencies of her own, uh, of his father's own sort of uh, repugnant behavior. But in doing so, he has to sacrifice his mother's love, right? Because his mother then cannot accept that, that Pierre has dishonored himself such. So for, for a piece of intelligence which, and this is what Melville's interesting, interested in, for a piece of intelligence which, in the natural course of things, many amiable gentlemen, both young and old, have been known to receive with a momentary feeling of surprise, and then a little curiosity to know more, and at last an entire unconcern, can in another case, or right, the case of Pierre, conspire in a truth that, quote, rolled down on his soul like melted lava and left so deep a deposit of desolation that all his subsequent endeavors never restored the original temples of the soil, nor all his culture completely revived in its buried bloom, right? So the note then, the letter, that provides a name, Isabel, and a referent, namely, that is his sister. And it's this truth which, which can never be confirmed, right? So that this becomes what is, is constantly destabling Pierre in the, in the novel, is the fact that he, we'll never know whether in fact Isabel is who she claims to be. There's no way of ultimately verifying it. So he has to accept it, he has to commit himself to the agency of the letter, so to speak. Um, okay. 
And the note then, so that it provides his name, whose truth is confirmed by ex 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 explanatory power. That is, namely, to explain the enigmas, the ambiguities that had always surrounded his father, and focus that were focused on the strangeness of this portrait. Right? So he has this portrait of his father right, that has an, a, an ambiguous smile. And his, his aunt had sort of these enigmatic stories that accounted for the strangeness of the smile. But this could never be, right? When could never, Pierre never could explain this. And his mother at the same time seemed to have a complete distaste for this portrait, right? So these are the kind of facts surrounding the one portrait. And so then this, this letter explains on the one hand suddenly, right, the ambiguity of this smile, right, when it is in fact yoked, right, to the image of the face of Isabel, right, his sister. And so then the, the verification then yokes together these two signs that in themselves have no relation necessarily, but are now put into relation through this truth. And if he, in fact, is going to write a truth also, which interestingly enough is delivered by a letter whose agent, namely fate, always remains obscure, right? And this fate, the, the person who delivers the, the letter to Pierre is described as the invulnerable knight, an invulnerable knight who wears his visor down, right? And so, <clears throat> and so the revelation then that, 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 that this brings upon, that the, the so-called truth then that, that, that Pierre here discovers is the contingency is the utter contingency of the values that he lived his life in accordance with, right? So the, namely the contingency of his mother's love, right? So this is a line. So she loveth me, I, but why? Had I been cast in a cripple's mold, how now then? Now do I remember that in her most caressing love there ever gleamed some scaly, glittering folds of pride. Right? So what, what the truth, then, at least what I think, is, is the truth then that, that discloses the utter contingency of the meaning that, had, that would have served and had placed and dictated Pierre's life. And this, these, this description right, of these two portraits the superimposition of these two portraits that, 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 that Pierre now is yoking together and whose yoke then serves to explain the enigmas of his, of his, of his life. Melville introduces, explains this in terms of a quote um, from Dante's Inferno, um, which is, Ah, how dost thou change, Angelo, Ange uh, An Angel Angelo, See, thou art nor double now, nor only one. Right, so it's a very bizarre formulation. See, thou art nor double now, nor only one. Right? So that what, 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 what Melville is saying is that, that what, what, then, what, um, what Pierre sees is that this image is neither double nor one. Right? And the question then is, can, if for Pierre to sustain himself within this indefinite regency opened up by the truth, he has to maintain, see himself as neither double, right, nor one. Right? It's, it's, it's neither, neither, neither the two nor the one. Now what we see though, and this is what's interesting, is that the deeper and deeper that um, Pierre goes into this, this truth, this interrogation, the deeper he goes, the more he is, in fact, thrust to the surface. Because, in fact, the truth ultimately provides nothing but the empty sign of the letter, right, as its own verification, ultimately. So the more he tries to, in some sense, verify it, the more he is brought back to a sign, which then seems to be ever more elusive, right? 
And so that this is how then that the truth then that seemed to open up this new horizon when pursued only seems to liquidate the very value of the truth that, that he was so marked by, right? Because it, 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 the, the, the letter which signifies something and is therefore meaningful is then be, is, 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 is progressively emptied of its, of, its, of its meaning, of its significance. And so as, he, as Melville writes, he glimpses the everlasting elusiveness of truth, the universal lurking insincerity of even the greatest and purest written thoughts. Um, and so then truth in the end annihilates all confidence, right? Annihilates his own confidence, his own belief in the truth to which he had then consigned his life. And can only be expressed, right, through Pierre's own descent into madness. And so... <clears throat> And this is what, 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 what's interesting is, and this is just maybe an, an aside because I would, wanted to sort of develop this more, but um, that I can't, that what's interesting is, is that in, in Melville, he sees this as this process in which this destruction that happens in, in the soul of the subject is through, one, in, insofar as one begins to seek one's true character, what one sees is that the character, namely the interiority that one seeks, is utterly dependent upon a series of characters, right? So that, so that Melville is constantly interested in, in this equivocity in the English sense of character, right? As being both a character and, you know, the, a, the letter. And it's that equivocity which then becomes the, 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 the central trope of the, of, of, of the confidence man, or, or more of the narrator who's narrating the confidence man. It's this constant play between these two senses of the word character, right? So that the confidence man will be the one who wholly owns the fact that his own character is nothing but a series of characters, right? In the sense of letters or signs. Now, this, 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 what this means then, and um, I, don't, I don't know if I'm, I'm probably moving too slowly because I'm sort of babbling on here, but... Um, Five more minutes. Okay, so let me then quickly then read. Um, okay, well I'm almost I'm almost at the end. So let me then say then because I think this might be is an interesting sort of opposition. Is that then the figure for Melville embodying the truth within sort of modern democracy, right? The anomaly, the anomalous status of America as a republic. The, the truth for Melville of this, who, who the speak the one who speaks the truth in this condition is not the philosopher but the misanthrope. So it's not Socrates, but Timon from Athens, right? Shakespeare's Timon from Athens that ends up becoming the enunciator of a truth. And this paradigmatic misanthrope, Shakespeare's Timon, is a figure shorn of his humanity and whose hatred of mankind is engendered by a shattering truth, right? And the shattering truth that, 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 that Timon experiences in, in Shakespeare and Shakespeare's play, is that there's nothing level in our cursed natures but direct villainy, right? So he says that the, he, he discovers, in other words, that the betrayal is the very nature of, of human relations, right? And it's this fundamental truth that he cannot get over. So Timon's embittered fury terminates in an all-consuming hatred that desires ultimately only destruction. Identifying himself wholly with this hatred writing, I am misanthropist and I hate humanity, Timon consigns himself to a truth can only, that can only be fulfilled through its own annihilation. So this is Shakespeare. Thou sun that comforts burn, speak and be hanged, for each true word a blister, and each false be as cauterizing to the root of the tongue, consuming it with speaking. Right. So what's interesting here is that is, that Timon here equally contemns truth and falsity insofar as it is hu a human distinction. So it's the human that speaks. And therefore, whether the human avouses falsity or truth, in each case, he is human and therefore must be destroyed. <clears throat> 
And such terminal hatred, such consistent, we could say, misanthropy, right? A misanthropy that, whose consistency can only turn on the logos, maintaining its utter inconsistency, right? Such a consistent misanthropy can only end in suicide, right? Because, in fact, to hate humanity requires hating one's own humanity, and one can only become equal to the truth of this through one's own hanging, right? And so the end of the, the play is we have a, the image of Timon's tree from which he hangs. Um, and so this, in other words, this, the, the, the paradox is, is that then the figure of misanthrope who represents the figure of radical enlightenment, in other words, absolute distrust, can only accomplish that distrust, right, remaining, you know, distrusting all of humanity by ultimately undoing his own belief in his self, right? So it's this, this, this consummation. Now, it is perhaps at this point, and for this reason that Melville provides us with a counter figure, right, the confidence man. And the confidence man is constantly, we could say, at war, right, with, with, with various figures, but centrally the misanthrope in, in, in the novel. And the truth which ultimately then destroys Melville, namely this sort of, this, the, the, the desiccation of his own self, becomes the positive condition for the confidence man's masquerade, right? So that the self, he's not tormented by this absent self, but in fact, quite joyously deploys it, right? And he deploys it only through the constant game of appearance, the game of deception, right? Requiring, on the one hand, belief, but nonetheless, constantly needing belief only so that he can occupy the position of the non-believer, right? So it's this paradoxical position that, in fact, he requires belief, namely that others believe in, in who he is in order to play the game. But in order for him to play the game, he himself does not believe in the self that he is trying to elicit belief in others, uh, uh, belief um, for others to believe in. So, the last, this figure then of the confidence man and I'll conclude with this. Um, as a figure who lacks himself, does not undergo the loss of self, right? presuming that he had one to lose, nor does he seek a self that he does not have and is indifferent to. Perfectly at home in his estrangement, he neither desires to know nor to educate. Right? We could say that he is self-interested in the sense that he wants to get, right, he, he's constantly trying to win over the confidence of others to believe in him, only he lacks a self to be interested in. So he is dis-self-interested in a way. He deceives, but he does not deceive himself, since he is not as he appears while being nothing besides that very appearance. And his game of confidence depends upon fostering and engendering a belief that he does not share and cannot. And so he exits the di this destructive dialectic of belief. Right? He neither believes in truth nor falsity, but we could say neutralizes the very distinction not through a theoretical cognition, but simply through his practice. So he's a figure that, in other words, of pure practice. <clears throat> and I think it might be interesting, I'll skip over it, um, that to, to compare uh, the confidence man and Bartleby, because in some ways they're, they're, they become polar figures. So that, in other words, Bartleby ultimately is a figure who, is, who's, who terminates himself in, in an asocial position, whereas the confidence man, we could say, is, is a pure social relation, right? He lives and thrives only through relations to others, right? And in doing so, he, he distantiates himself from, from all those others. Right? So it's a game 
played within society rather than a game that seeks to, to escape society. And so I think this is, if I had more time, um, this is where I would seek to sort of locate the sense of the confidence man's humor. The way in which he does not seek a game that tries to exceed the laws of the society which he operates, but rather neutralize them by, by distantiating himself from the law's effect or grip on him, right? And this would be the movement of, uh, of humor, right? And this would make him um, a genial misanthrope. Um, so I could I'd read a passage, but maybe I'll just end right there. Okay, thanks. Thank you.